Warren, I have felt for most of my life that the deepest probe I can make to the nature of reality is to try to understand consciousness. Many of my friends who are scientists say that's ridiculous, that consciousness is just something that randomly emerged in this isolated planet and this, this fringe part of one galaxy out of many. How do you see consciousness? What is it? Uh, consciousness is a mystery. Uh, I don't think it's as great a mystery as some people make it out to be, as if sort of some ephemeral important mystery out there. I do think it is, is a phenomena of our brain function. It's emergent, in a sense, from our brain function. Uh, you can see that in problems of brain disorder that reduce consciousness in some way or radically alter consciousness. So you brainstem, you know, you, a damage, you lose consciousness, uh, hallucinogenic drugs, you have this massive <laughs> impact on consciousness, on what is consciousness, on, on the way consciousness is going. Um, you um, eliminate uh, systems that would allow for the, for the understanding of language and consciousness now gets altered, at least, in the sense that certain kinds of things cannot be represented in consciousness. And then consciousness as a phenomenon itself, I think there's starting to be some pretty good theories about how this might take place within the context of electrical uh, patterns of electrical activity um, modulating over the surface or in the cerebral cortex, networks that form that that are active for a moment and give us that moment of consciousness. Consciousness to me has got to include uh, working memory. That is those things we hold in mind at the moment in order to manipulate them in some way. And that the usefulness of consciousness for our action in the world is, uh, I think, something about the um, um, apparentness and reality of both the current and the, the remembered in a way that allows us to work these together in order to act in the world. I really think the problem for human brains, for human beings, is action in the world. And so I don't think consciousness is something out here divorced from its engagement in regulation and manipulation and formulation of action in the world. So we have to act and our consciousness allows us to maybe even run a scenario of some possible action in the future while I'm sitting here doing nothing. But it is nevertheless kind of linked to action, I think. So you don't see consciousness as something that can really exist other than this relationship relating to the outside world. No, e I think yes. I, I don't even think if it's it imagined can. to the to the outside yeah. world, you don't have to physically yeah. do it. Yeah, I mean, I I think that what we do when we imagine something is we're basically running an action scenario offline. Right, right. But it's nevertheless run in systems that otherwise engage the world. So if my consciousness is to imagine. Uh, uh, playing with my granddaughter at home, I'm running a scenario of action in the world offline, but nevertheless engaging those systems in my nervous system that would be active were I actually there doing that or seeing what I would see and, and, and hearing what I would hear and, and feeling what I would feeling if I were doing that. I can go with you the whole route. Everything that you say, I totally agree with you. But I think you're leaving something fundamentally out. And that is you are impoverishing the phenomenal, internal, subjective, first person, any phrase you want to use, feeling of what it's like to do all of those yeah. things. Because I can imagine a, a zombie that has no consciousness doing all of that including the need to interrelate because of some behavioral uh, uh, patterns that need to improve its relationship for its own self-subsistence, et cetera. But with, I don't need any of the internal would, feelings. Would a, would a zombie have an imagination? Would a zombie be able to uh, run a scenario about future action in the world Maybe. in some way that, that, that calls on the memory of those experiences from the past. So your phenomenal awareness 
is, I think, no different than the awareness I have of sensory motor events as they occur in real life. So for you to, to talk about zombies without consciousness, they would have to be zombies that don't, aren't really phenomenally aware of anything going on anytime. And I don't think animals are, are that unaware. Uh, sure. And, and, and so I think consciousness, I, I like I say, it, how that comes about is still mysterious, but not totally mysterious. I think there are lots of ways that we are beginning to understand how the brain might work to make things uh, uh, ready to hand at the moment that aren't necessarily a part of, of my physical engagement right now. So I'm sitting in a chair here, but I, and that's my physical experience in the world, but I may be able to imagine out of my memory for things in the world, things that have happened in the past. And so I'm not sure what you buy by this, it's called qualia in philosophy, what you buy with the term qualia that isn't inherent in the idea that I am a self-aware and uh, aware of my circumstances as I engage the world and have the ability to recreate those using working memory and, and you know, things that get involved in imagination. When you've worked in, uh, in neuropsychology with uh, patients who have problems yeah. and, and damage, either congenital or uh, as a result of injury and trauma, uh, what are some of the um, the specific impacts that you see on consciousness? For me, in the context I work, I work with people without the major structure that interconnects the two cerebral hemispheres, the corpus callosum. They have been born without that, so it's a congenital abnormality. 200 million neurons are just not there. The two hemispheres are not well connected. They're connected a little bit, but not well connected. And they have a cognitive, they can be in the normal range of tested intelligence, but they nevertheless have, have issues. And they have issues, for example, in the understanding of the second order meaning of language. So if I use a metaphor, person without the corpus callosum understands the concrete part of the metaphor, but they may not understand the second level of meaning yeah. or how that second level of me meaning actually applies mm -hmm. to our conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, then they're plenty conscious, plenty self-aware, but there's a whole lot of stuff going on that f would be part of the consciousness of somebody with a corpus callosum, which might also involve some emotional engagement in the situation because of that, that they would not be a part of their consciousness. And I think you can work that down in neural systems to things we would be less and less aware of if we had a more impoverished nervous system, either because of brain trauma or brain damage or because of uh, phylogenetic. Yeah, you can use the same levels. argument to go to. Yeah, the you low, just kind of right. work it down. There's less that you are consciously right. aware of. Right. And so I really think it's amount of information that can be present, interpreted, an interpretive set. So their self-consciousness, I think, is slightly different because they don't represent themselves in this quite as sophisticated a way in the in this social relationship and so they are conscious less of what is going on here than you and I might be with a corpus callosum okay so what are the implications of that for the for the core concept of consciousness um core concept versus uh, neurophysiology. I think. I think neurophysiologically, neurocognitively, that uh, consciousness is a term we use to identify a sort of an emergent conglomeration of all some kinds of things that are particularly apparent and useful at the moment mm. and and engage us. And then we have it out here in philosophy of mind. The idea consciousness it's a box <laughs> and i don't think it's a box <laughs> i think it's a a interesting conglomeration changing so at some time my body may be part of my consciousness another time my body is totally out of my consciousness i used to drive to ucla for a whole hour and get to ucla and park my car and think i have no consciousness <laughs> no memory of being conscious 
of all of the things that happened driving along, because I was thinking about this, yeah. but I negotiated well. Yeah. So at some lower level, there were things that going on that weren't quite as as apparent to me, quite as engaging of my memory. They weren't linked into my episodic memory, so I don't remember them when I get there. But I functioned well driving <laughs> my car because I made it every day <laughs> well. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think the you can take the word consciousness and put it out here in an abstract box, and then it becomes a problem. <laughs> but if you break down the box and say, well, it's not one thing, it's it's a network of things, and it's a property that merges out of a lot of things, then it becomes a little less mysterious. Still mysterious, but a little less mysterious.